Hello and welcome back live from the Grote Kerk in The Hague to the second part of this Jason Jubilee conference. We have an interesting program and I hope that everyone who played the war game has, uh, has been able to uh, provide world peace and will be able to join us for the second part of this program. We got a very interesting panel right now coming up on the rise of China and basically it is set up as follows. We have three mini lectures of each 15 minutes and then we will open up the floor for questions and answers. So please, again, if you're in the coffee room and the, if you have any interesting questions for any of the speakers, let us know and we'll ask them here live later on. Um, we'll kick off this program with Rogier Kramers, who is an assistant professor in modern Chinese studies at the Leiden University, followed by Rosemary Gibson, the senior advisor at the Hastings Center and also the author of the book China Rx, Exposing the Risk of American Dependence on China for Medicine. A very relevant topic indeed. And we'll close off the panel with Colonel Niels Woutstra, Deputy Head Permanent Military Representative to the EU and NATO. But our first speaker, uh, Rogi Kremers, will talk about China's growing importance in global digital affairs. So please kick off Rogi Kremers. Good afternoon and uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and indeed the invitation. It's an honor to be here. I think it's safe to say that um, things with China or our relationships with China between the West, the United States and Europe and China are at the lowest point that they've been for quite some time, at least since the aftermath of the uh, Tiananmen events of the year 1989. Uh, just over the past couple of weeks, we've had uh, escalating sanctions um, where the United States, Europe and China have sanctioned uh, academics, politicians, party members, uh, research institutions, uh, amongst others from traveling. Uh, and more broadly, uh, we see that we are in a pattern of growing assertiveness, uh, growing tension, uh, a growing inability to uh, agree on fundamental terms of coexistence. What lies at the heart of these tensions, and there are obviously many topics, but this is a, a very important one, is digital technology. And that uh, covers a number of grounds. Part of it has to do with uh, China's growing footprint as a technology provider. I'm sure I don't need to uh, elaborate on uh, the controversy uh, surrounding the telecommunications firm Huawei. But it is also about the Chinese use of digital technology for programs of surveillance and other forms of population management that uh, the West asserts uh, runs counter to its values, most obviously, of course, uh, the occurrences in the region of Xinjiang. Some observers have already talked about that we may well end up in a new Cold War, which is going to very much play out in the digital realm, a technology Cold War. Um, and the question that I would like to ask is, if there is technology Cold War coming, that's the hypothesis for today, um, how did we get here? What happened to the digital sphere that brought us to this point? And I must admit that I'm a little bit of a committed historicist. I believe that uh, if we ask the question, how did we get to where we are today, we must start looking at the past. And we must start looking at the structures that we've created, commercial structures, economic structures, technological structures, and political structures, how these have all, and the evolutions and changes therein, how these have all contributed to where we are today. And when we look at digital technology, there's something really interesting. Digital technology really came uh, of age in the wake of the Cold War. And as such, it symbolizes a very dominant form of thinking that uh, took hold among Western governments after the end of the Cold War, uh, which we can sort of see as the end of history thesis. And that thesis, briefly put, holds that the West has won the Cold War. It has won the Cold War because of the innate superiority of its political, economic, social system. That system is characterized by 
liberal democracy and free market economics, and that therefore, in order to sort of go into the future, because history has ended, we've arrived at the maximum of what's possible, all we need to do is manage democracy and free market economics, uh, enhance it, so say more market economic mechanisms in public services for instance, or more referendums or direct forms of input, uh, and spread them to the rest of the world, preferably by them recognizing that liberal democracy and free markets are the best and doing so and sort of coming around voluntarily or with regard to countries who quote unquote don't share our values uh, we must uh, convince them uh, to come around um, the hard way now digital technology uh, you know the digital technology that we see all around us today very much symbolizes that um, that narrative in the sense that very often the way that we talked about technology ethics in the past two decades has been very much shaped by that. Until very recently, um, the story of the technology sector was one of unbridled optimism, one of disruption, one of change. You know, a story in which we thought that technology could solve all of our problems, right? Twitter and Facebook would bring um, democracy to places where it didn't exist, right? We called the Arab Spring, in, t uh, in the meantime, nearly a decade ago. We call that the Twitter revolution or the Facebook revolution. Uh, economically as well, you know, the technology sector with its disruptive innovation would uh, cut away all the dead wood, all the inefficiencies of our economies and make us all a lot wealthier. Right. We are now at a point in time where many of these promises have not come true and it seems like we've swung the other way. China, on the other hand, um, has been very much a technological laggard. In the late 70s, when China embarked upon its project of economic reform and opening up to the outside world, it was one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and uh, under Deng Xiaoping, science and technology was marked as a key uh, component of any project to restore China to the position of wealth and power to which it aspires. Make no bones about it. The, the objective of the Chinese leadership is to make China as wealthy as Europe or the United States, which is not necessarily something uh, unjustifiable. And it wants to be as powerful as necessary to avoid the humiliations of the past. Uh, what the Chinese uh, leadership calls the century of humiliation, which started uh, with the opium wars of the mid-19th century and ended uh, with the communist victory in 1949 uh, and in between obviously all kinds of invasion and foreign intrusion in China. So China equally aspires to a, a position of global power in which it is capable of running its own show without interference or disturbance from abroad. Science and technology is going to play an important role in that and therefore China has invested uh, heavily in research and development obviously from a very very low starting point um, but if you do that consistently for four decades suddenly you come at the point where uh, you've got some really good companies doing really interesting things. Um, And this is what China starts doing. And China starts first becoming a manufacturing base for technological products. Uh, it's wonderful how uh, many American writers would say things like, you know, the Chinese, they're not innovative, they could never make an iPhone uh, without recognizing that pretty much every single iPhone is made in China. And that in order to do so, in order to produce iPhones at volume, Chinese subcontractors, uh, Chinese public institutions, and so on and so forth, have had to invest heavily in infrastructure, supporting know-how, and all of the other underpinnings that you need to run a highly sophisticated, highly complex manufacturing chain in the 21st century. And uh, certainly when President Obama asked Steve Jobs whether it was possible for Apple to move production out of China, at least at that point in time, the answer was no. Uh, 
And that answer might well still be no, uh, might well still be no, um, or at least, if it is possible, it's going to be highly expensive. But through becoming a manufacturing base, China acquired, or Chinese businesses acquired a lot of uh, soft skills, a lot of management skills, and these started flowing over into the domestic ecosystem. And suddenly, the arrival of the smartphone, a product which drives uh, the adoption of digital technology in China, um, digital technology suddenly gets a huge internal market. We're now at the point, uh, a couple of months ago, the number of uh, connected people in China, which, you know, we must be honest, for all of the glitz and glamour of Shanghai, Guangzhou, Beijing and other cities is very much still a middle-income country. China has now over a billion people online, over 90% of which use mobile devices as their prime uh, tool of, um, uh, of, of, of gaining online access. The Chinese government enthusiastically uses digital means to expand its government capability and very often is very successful in doing so, if for no other reason than that uh, China, as I said 40 years ago, one of the poorest countries in the world, is and will be for quite some time in a position where digital 21st century solutions are not just necessary, but also very promising in generating the sort of leapfrogging development that uh, China intends. It's sort of going from nothing to mobile phones or smartphones even without having to go through uh, landlines and then non-smart mobile phones. So the Chinese level of digital adoption has also grown. And suddenly, these Chinese capabilities make us worried because what they do is they challenge the story that we've told to ourselves since the end of the Cold War. That liberal democracy plus free market capitalism is the only way in which a country can be competent and, which, and in which a country can be moral. Now I'm afraid to go into the discussion of morality. Um, we would by far surpass the 15 minutes that I've been given. But let us talk about competence. So, uh, suddenly, uh, certainly, if there is anything that the coronavirus pandemic has demonstrated is that um, democracies can be far less competent than we think in, for instance, managing sudden crises, but also more broadly, if we see the pandemic as a sort of stress test, it has showed up the extent to which public institutions in many Western countries have deteriorated to an extent where they no longer are resilient to really any sort of crisis. China, on the other hand, has had to be competent because it essentially could no longer afford to be as incompetent as it was, for instance, under the Mao era, which killed a couple of tens of millions of people. Now, people don't necessarily like their stories to be challenged, right? Stories are the things, stories, narratives are the things that we live by. They are the, they are the way in which we structure our reality. And very often people would rather die than change their story. Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of the post-Cold War story. We are coming to the post-Cold -post War period. The paradigm that we had, where we believed in the end of history, liberal democracy, free market capitalism, automatically functions, is automatically better. That paradigm has to come to an end because it has been demonstrated not to be true. China's rise as a technology power underlines the extent to which this isn't true. And obviously, there are many hard reasons why our interests in the technology field and in other fields between China and the West diverge. There are, of course, conflicts over hard economic interests. There are, of course, conflicts over values and morality. There is, of course, a conflict over prestige, which is, after all, you know, the, uh, the currency, very often, of international relations. For China, having a company like Huawei being a global leader, for instance, in 5G connectivity, isn't just about bringing money in, that's very nice. It isn't just about uh, espionage, which, you know, uh, this is what you do when you're strong in telecommunications, this is what 
Britain, the United States and other uh, countries have done for decades, but it is also simply about being able to say that you, have, that you are a world leader. Right? Obviously these, con um, these conflicts exist. But the question really is, how are we going to come to a point where we can coexist with China? There are many people who believe that China can be put back into its box with the right application of pressure. I don't think that is the case. Uh, I also think that governments in the West at the moment do not have a vision or a view of the future in which there is room for China that doesn't democratize. Right. For decades, we've been able to sidestep the difficult question of how we are going to coexist with a China that does not democratize, with a China that does not become a liberal market economy. And yet, even if it's just to avoid conflict, which I think is becoming increasingly likely, so certainly the current situation smells a lot more like 1913 than I am comfortable with, to avoid conflict and to tackle global challenges, at least climate change, we must find some sort of narrative about the future in which there is some room for China. China, on the other hand, must recognize that it cannot have everything it wants either. China must also come to develop a narrative in which there is room for it not to get its own way, in a way that it has been very much able to do over the past couple of decades. In other words, these real clashes, these or potential clashes, certainly conflicts and tensions, must be recognized as being symptoms of a need for a changing paradigm for technology politics. That paradigm is going to be a very difficult one. It's going to mean that we need to think more seriously about security considerations, certainly more seriously than we've done where we've seen digital technology primarily as a commercial field, which means that we've organized the digital economy in, in order to uh, prioritize efficiency. Other logics than the economic logics will have to come in. And these are difficult questions that, they, that must be answered because they're going to cost money. Um, and that is going to be the real difficult challenge. Already we are having a discussion about how to govern technology within our own countries. A discussion that China had with itself 20 years ago and which it had in a much more competent manner than we did. And we do not, right, China started asking itself the question far earlier about what the consequences would be about the broad adoption of digital technology. And one doesn't necessarily have to agree with the answers China has given to some of those questions, and certainly I do not, in order to recognize that they were the right questions to ask and that we didn't ask them. We now seem to be in a state of mind where we think that we can change Beijing, for instance, in its policy on digital technology, by making it possible for Huawei to buy chips, for instance. Um, I think our ability to influence poli policy in Beijing is limited and may well be shrinking. That means that we need to tackle some difficult problems here and we need to recognize that the situation of normality that we all got used to and that was very beneficial to us in the 1990s, 2000s, even early 2010, is probably not going to return in the foreseeable future. We are now living through the end of the end of history. So let's be clever about it and let's be competent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Rogi Kramers, for this very interesting talk. I would like to invite you to join me here to, so we can answer some questions. And they already are pouring in. So, viewers, thank you very much for asking us all these different questions. Um, the posture of, towards China from not taking it really serious five years ago towards a real threat perception. Um, we were talking before. It really reminds me a bit of how we perceived Russia earlier. Uh, we had the same dealings and the same views of once it has a liberal democracy, the bling bling ideology of Putin, Moscow was a hip and mundane city where you could go and all of a sudden uh, NATO had some problems with uh, with their uh, protective shield, uh, nuclear shield and it brought us really back to our feet. Do you think we as Western countries have certain difficulties, difficulties to deal with countries who have actually uh, behave outside our predeposed value frame, so to say? 
Well, one could argue that, um, but certainly if we sidestep Russia, which is obviously a very useful example, but if you look at Japan, if you look at some of the literature that was being written about Japan in the 1980s, actually a lot of the narrative is actually fairly similar to what we see about China today, where it is sort of the yellow peril and they're costing us jobs. And in the United States, you would have people attacking Japanese cars because how dare you not buy a car made in Detroit? Uh, so even, you know, Japan after the Second World War, very much part of the Western alliance, very much on our side, very much, you know, a liberal democracy and free market country, we didn't like the competition. We didn't, certainly in the United States, right, the notion that another country could simply, for instance, build better cars or build better electronics was anathema. And um, I'm afraid to say that uh, we do seem to be a little self-satisfied in the way that we look at the rest of the world. We overestimate very often uh, how good we are. Uh, we underestimate uh, how good others can be. And when they are good, we, uh, uh, we say that it is because they cheated, right? Yeah. Which is very often the narrative that we get about China. And yes, to be sure, uh, you know, there has been more than enough ed uh, evidence of things like economic espionage emerging from China. Um, but very often that story then gets turned into China is only big because it cheated. And it really overlooks, uh, one, that uh, China actually does have some merit, right? Some of its comp companies, uh, certainly its human capital you know, is really good. Some of its policies have been extremely competent. Um, but I also think it underestimates the extent to which this has suited us, right? Buying stuff from China has enabled us to live materially very comfortable lives. One could even argue uh, we've been living above our means essentially because China has been willing uh, to take the burden of low cost, low value added production as a step on the way up. And it's no longer satisfied with that. Yeah. And then suddenly that confronts us with the fact that um, our own story, our own narrative, our own daily normality seems to be built on loose sand. Yeah, interesting. We have a lot of questions from the audience uh, and only 10 minutes to go, so I'll just see how far we can get. Uh, there's a question from uh, Sophie Latry. Thank you for asking this question. And she wonders, how do Chinese citizens perceive the way they are limited, monitored and censored by the Chinese government at the moment? And isn't it likely that they will revolt at some point? Difficult question. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, do you have about a day or two? Uh, th uh, Ten minutes. So. <laughs> how, do how do Chinese citizens perceive that? Well, I haven't asked them. Certainly not all of them. Yeah. Uh, but there are a couple of things that one can say. One, there seems to be an assumption that, you know, we, you and I, and certainly the people watching, will be the sort of people who are extremely interested in politics, right? We, uh, you know, we know who we have on our Twitter feeds. We know the things that we talk about. The vast majority of people actually isn't that interested in politics. They certainly don't talk about it on a daily basis. Uh, you know, there are these wonderful statistics where, uh, you know, even in the Netherlands, the majority of people can't name more than three ministers. Um, and certainly... That is true in China as well. So that is one thing. Uh, the other thing is, you know, you get these very culturalist, you know, Chinese people are just like that. They think in a much more collective manner than we are. Well, certainly some of the great thinkers in Chinese political history don't think so, right? You have uh, Sun Yat-sen, who is seen by both the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China on Taiwan as the father of the nation. And he writes about how, you know, the Chinese people are a sheet of loose sand, right? They don't stick together. They do not think collectively. Um, but there are a couple of things here. Um, in 19, between 1959 and 1961, incompetent policies led to a famine that killed 30 million people. Between 1966 and 1976, you know, you had the Cultural Revolution, which caused a lot of turmoil and certainly poverty. That means that, you know, for many Chinese people, absolute poverty, destitution and misery uh, and indeed political totalitarianism, totalitarianism, real totalitarianism, where the state decided your job, your spouse, uh, where you ate, what you ate, uh, what you wore. Um, for a lot of people, that's living memory. So for a lot of Chinese people within living memory, or certainly, you know, stories they get from their parents or their grandparents, um, things are now vastly better than they have been. And so what we assume very often is that, you know, 
within every person who isn't living in a Western style democracy, there is a sort of Jeffersonian Democrat, you know, under their, you know, whatever religion or whatever ethnicity or gender or whichever category you want to put on it. There is a Jeffersonian democracy, uh, a Jeffersonian Democrat who's just waiting to jump out if only the shackles are removed. Yeah. And that isn't necessarily the case. If you look at it from the institutional perspective, right, this isn't just about people revolting. This is about uh, political evolutions which very often take centuries, right? It takes 800 years between the formation of the British House of Commons and the institution of universal suffrage, which means that every British citizen can vote for the House of Commons. Um, it takes centuries for something like the rule of law to be established, and very many of the things that we hold to be natural, self-evident, even when it is about sort of human rights issues. Many Europeans don't know that France was using the guillotine to cut the heads off of people in 1977. So these things are very often very new and, um, you know, they take a lot of time to get established and to get evolved. Now in China, you have zero tradition of a division of political power. Power traditionally was vested in the emperor and the imperial bureaucracy full stop. There wasn't an established church where you had to sort of navigate church and state as you had in most places in Europe. Um, so China had a different political evolution there. Now all political power is not vested in an individual but in a collective organization, the, People's Rep uh, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party. And so before you're going to even get to anything where you can talk about democracy, you're going to need a couple of centuries of experimenting with divided forms of power. Which is, you know, and that is a big if. So, yeah, this is not going to happen. The Chinese people may well revolt, right? They've revolted in the past, but it doesn't mean that... The same conditions and under the same circumstances as we might expect. Yeah. Uh, well, or they might want different things, or certainly regardless of what people want, you know, um, politics is a collective phenomenon, not an individual phenomenon, so you get emergent properties. And we should, under, we should be under no illusion, right? We think that once the Communist Party of China disappears, that a flourishing liberal democracy will somehow emerge on its ashes. That's what we thought 110 years ago when the empire disappeared. And that's what a lot of Chinese people expected as well. Yeah. Not quite how it worked out. Okay, thank you. I think we have room for one more question. Um, I think we'll take a NATO-related question, of course. Uh, China releases 100-year plan which challenges our current world, uh, world order. So how would you consider necessary steps to counter this development, especially in regards to NATO, is Sasha wondering? Oh, does this refer to that book, you know, China's 100-year plan? I think that plan... Yeah. I, I think the book is mostly a load of nonsense. <laughs> um, or or it, it sort of, you know... A lot of what we do is we take our own ideas about global power or our vision of global power and we project them onto China. Mm -hmm. So if you're an American, you know, for, for an American foreign policy person to be powerful internationally, and this is the way that the West has looked at global power for centuries, is you go out into the world and you do things, mm -hmm. right? You start micromanaging other places and you could do it through colonization. Uh, you could do it through global institutions, as the Americans have done, but it's sort of you go out into the world and you change stuff there. For the moment, China does not yet have that definition of power. It may, it may well evolve it in the future, but it does not have it yet. For China, the definition of world power isn't yet to go out into the world and change things, to go out into the world... Uh, and, and sort of take over countries or impose norms of governance. Rather, it has become so powerful that no one dared touch it. Mm. And maybe, you know, if other people want to follow the wonderful example, between quotes, of, of, of China, they're obviously welcome to do so. But it is not part of Chinese policy. Uh, they don't look at global power in the same way. And then the question, you know, I always get this, how can we counter China? How can we win our war with China? Or how can we win the race or the competition? Why would you? Right? What's, what's the purpose here? Um, I'd like to think that the purpose of our government is to create better countries in Europe, in, in America, anywhere in the world for us. And um, Obviously, you know, where China poses a clear security risk, uh, that is something we need to deal with. But very often the way in which China may pose a security risk is in direct response to our global policies, uh, right? Uh, like I said, China wants to become as wealthy as we are, right? Automatically, that means greater competition. But the problem is, 
if we arrogate to ourselves the wealth that we have, we cannot justifiably deny it to others. In terms of security, if we arrogate to ourselves the power to, say, extrajudicially kill people because we say they're terrorist leaders halfway around the world with drones, you know, sooner or later, you're going to have a country like China that says, well, we'll have some of that cookie too. Yeah. So it seems to me that a lot of what we need to think about first isn't just sort of reflexively respond to whatever China does that we don't like. It is to actually have a long, hard look at ourselves and, and have that difficult but necessary discussion again. Where does our interest lie? What do we need? Um, and what can we get? What is feasible, right? Yeah. From an because without a goal, you don't have a strategy even to begin with. Exactly. Yeah. There are very many people who mistake, movement, uh, who mistake movement for action, yeah. as it were. There are also very many people who mistake process for strategy. Um, no, strategy is about having a clear goal and then deploying ways and means of achieving it. And it's sad to say we simply do not have that clear goal right yeah. now except from stopping China from doing things that it doesn't like. Well, surprise, surprise, China is going to continue doing things that we don't like. Um, can we stop that? I'm having some renovations done to my house. And as it turns out, my contractor is a little bit of an existential philosopher. So I'll be asking things like, oh, and can we do this and this in the living room or in the kitchen? And his answer is almost like, you know, uh, a French uh, 1960s uh, intellectual. You can do anything you like, Dr. Kramers, if you have the budget. <laughs> Are we willing to, you know, yeah. pay the cost of what it takes to actually, you know? There, there are some things that, you know, China won't do unless we m may even go to war. Now, for me, that's not, that's not an option. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for this very sobering uh, conclusion uh, to this panel. The time really flew by. We have way more questions than we have time to answer them. Rogi Kremers, thank you very much for your uh, contribution. And now we will give the floor to Rosemary Gibson. She's a senior advisor at the Hastings Center and author of China RX, exposing the risk of American dependence on China for medicine. Rosemary, please start your contribution. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today. Uh, as uh, was just mentioned in the introduction, I'll be talking about uh, the results of uh, research that I did over the course of three years beginning in 2014. I was looking simply to write another book. And I am not an expert in, well now I am, in pharmaceutical manufacturing. I'm not an expert in China. And I came at this from the perspective of a journalist and a private citizen. Uh, no one has paid me to do this uh, research. And what I discovered was so uh, compelling that I uh, have found it uh, crucial for our public health security and national security to share it as widely uh, as I can. I've had the privilege of testifying on before Congress in the United States, uh, speaking with uh, reporters in countries around the world on this subject. China RX came out in 2018, before the pandemic, and it turns out a lot of what was said in there has come true. The, the, the world experienced uh, this uh, COVID pandemic. And what was so extraordinary is how dependent the world is. All of us in Europe, the EU, Australia, Africa, Asia. How dependent the world is on the core materials we need to make generic drugs, the basic medicines that make our healthcare systems run. And I testified before Congress about how dependent we are, and this was right before the pandemic. And it turns out the medicines that were used in hospitals throughout the EU, the US, Australia, Africa, Asia, 90% of the core chemicals, the raw materials to make them are sourced in a single country. And here's a list of some of the medicines. You know, people were on a ventilator. They needed a, a sedative called propofol. Well, the core ingredients for that are sourced from a single country. It's much like the rare earth story, where we have centralization of the global supply chain for rare earths for consumer products like hybrid cars and other, um, and so forth. The same thing we have in our medicine supply. 
the other thing that we saw was because there was a pandemic, we had many countries and half of the EU countries banned some exports of medicines and medical supplies because, of course, people need them, countries need them for their own people. And meanwhile, we had 100 countries competing for the same medicines from largely a single source, again, the raw materials. So we've all been through that. And a lot of this didn't make headline news. We heard a lot about PPE, masks, gowns, gloves. And the primary uh, manufacturer was, uh, was based in China. And we also heard about masks that didn't work, that didn't protect people that were substandard. There were 9 million hospital surgical gowns used in operating rooms that were found to be contaminated with bacteria that were sold. COVID tests that gave inaccurate results. So we had quality issues that caused chaos. And behind the scenes, we also had dramatic shortages of some of the essential medicines to care for COVID patients because of the centralization of the global supply chain in a single country, whatever country it is. That doesn't work in a pandemic or in geopolitics or in a global emergency. When I wrote China RX, it has, by the way, 900 footnotes. And I did that to make sure that it could be as fast as possible. I wrote it as a journalist, I call the old fashioned journalist, not with a predetermined point of view, but in the public interest, because this, the subject is so profound for the health of all of us. I predicted that in the event of a natural disaster or a global pandemic, U.S. and other countries will be waiting in line for essential drugs. And that's turned out to be the case. I was interviewed by a number of media outlets in Europe, and the reporters told me about a shortage of paracetamol, acetaminophen. Even French President Macron talked about that. And why is that? Because of the centralization of the global supply of the core components in a single country. And I'll tell you in a minute how that centralization happened. The second prediction has also come true. In Europe, you have the European Medicines Agency that's to guard and protect uh, people of the EU to ensure that the medicines are of high quality. Well, both in the EU and the United States, we have dramatically diminished ability to protect the public, to protect you and me from some substandard drugs. So it's not just the quantity, but also the quality that we've lost control of. I'll make four quick points, and I look forward to your, the dialogue, your questions, your observations, because this is a topic that generates both personal interest as well as professional interest from a public health and national security perspective. How dependent is the U.S. and the world? We're in the same boat here. Essential generic drugs. Again, these are the medicines we need in the best of times to run hospitals, but certainly needed during the course of a pandemic when people are hospitalized. And I'm not talking about vaccines here. I'm talking about the basic drugs that are used every day, the antibiotics um, and, and so much else, blood pressure medicine. How did we get here? What are the risks and what do we do about it? So how dependent is the US and the world on China? The United States has virtually no capacity to manufacture antibiotics. We cannot make penicillin for ear infections to treat bronchitis or pneumonia, common conditions. We can't make them anymore. Europe is in a better situation because Sandoz still maintains a penicillin plant, which is very, very smart. This is a quote from a European generic manufacturer, Hovion Givalax. When I interviewed him for China RX, he said, if China stopped exporting ingredients to the US within three months, all the pharmacies would be pretty empty. And what I appreciated was, it was more the European industry people in the generic space who were much more transparent and open with me. And I am grateful to them for that transparency. This is a very important point of how we got here. I think most of us think, well, we, you know, China 
is uh, taking over markets because, well, they're just cheaper. They have lower labor costs. They have weaker environmental and labor regulations. But in fact, there's a deeper story here. This is the story about why the U.S. doesn't make penicillin anymore, and neither does India. This is the story of what I call the penicillin cartel. And I'm grateful to the European Fine Chemicals Group who shared this data with me about what's happened with the global penicillin market. And this is the playbook for why the uh, the Europe and the U.S. and so many other industrialized countries have lost so much of their industries. It's not, as you'll see, it's not just because it's cheaper labor or different environmental and labor regulations. It's something else taking place. This is the penicillin cartel with data from the European industry. And they've tracked this for thousands of other components necessary in the basic medicines that people use. So this is actually a very simple uh, bar graph. The top line is global production of penicillin. This is the raw material. And you see a China's growth in the share of that raw material with the purple bars that are a subset of the larger bars. And this is from the late 80s to about mid 2000s. Take a look at the yellow line the yellow line is price. Look what happened in 2004. That's when China dumped on the global market the raw material to make penicillin. And they kept it low for four years. That is when the last U.S. and the last Indian penicillin plant shut down. And then when global market was predominant by China, then it raised the price. The yellow line goes back up. This is the playbook of forming cartels, price fixing, controlling uh, supply and exports. And these are illegal trade practices. But this is how the I documented in China RX. It's why there's no vitamin C made in the U.S. anymore. Probably in Europe, I found one plant in, in Britain. It's why the U.S. doesn't make aspirin anymore. And this is why the same th story with acetaminophen, paracetamol. So these are unfair trade practices. And so if you're a European or U.S. company, you're not competing with a Chinese company. You're competing with the Chinese government and its subsidies. And this is the industrial base that has been lost. This was that last penicillin fermentation plant up in Syracuse, New York, that closed in 2004. And that was widely reported in the media about its closure that year, but no one told the backstory. No one did the real good journalism to say why was it closing. And that's where China RX, nearly 16 years later, did that. Again, thanks to very public spirited people in the uh, in industry in Europe who shared their data. And this is a gentleman, uh, Chris Oldenhoff, who's uh, retired, was a pharmaceutical executive in Europe. And I thought he's from the Netherlands. And he, I was really struck by his comment. This is from a Dutch public television documentary that uh, came, the first one came out in 2019. And he said, now we're afraid China will do things to deprive us of our medication. And the Netherlands isn't in a great kerfuffle with China. But now you can say that the raw material worldwide. If you control medicines, you control the world. If a president of a country gets a phone call, think of the leverage from, from China who wants a government to act in a certain way. Think of the leverage that this affords. What if they decide to withhold antibiotics? If we think infectious disease from COVID is bad, wait till they, wait till anyone withholds antibiotics. The deaths from COVID will be minuscule compared to that. If you control medicines, you control the world within weeks. This is 
where that chokehold exists. It's what I call the tip of the triangle. It's not the finished drugs, the pills we take. It's not the ingredients, but those raw materials. Right there at the tip of the triangle. And now China's moving up the value chain. They're, they have 10% of the U.S. generic market. Here's labels of what is being made in China by their domestic companies. Doxycycline. That's an antibiotic. It's used for an antidote to anthrax, as well as Lyme disease, other conditions. Chemotherapy products, antidepressants, birth control pills, medicines for Alzheimer's, HIV AIDS. And this, their market share of finished drugs is growing rapidly. And they're coming into um, domestic, uh, into the US to make the finished drugs and this is a very troubling situation because this company, one of its subsidiaries, made a blood pressure medicine in China that contained car dramatic amounts of carcinogens. Uh, Europe, the US, and other more than 23 countries were affected by, in 2018, the realization that blood, common blood, generic blood pressure medicines contained enormous amount of carcinogens. And the biggest perpetrator was a company in China where the FDA finally got in to the manufacturing facility. And the amount of carcinogen per pill was more than 200 times the acceptable limit. And people were taking this pill every day to control their blood pressure. And that same company has opened up a manufacturing facility in North Carolina in the United States. Meanwhile, Western generic companies are collapsing. Mylan, Teva, Sandoz is, has, I think, more of a commitment than uh, U.S. companies. Mylan merged with Pfizer, so it's gone. And then Pfizer announced the opening of its global generic headquarters in Shanghai in 2019. And why does that happen? The branded companies are, get, have given up their generic space in return for access to the Chinese market for their higher uh, margin products. And so we have drug shortages in this country. This is an FDA drug shortage list. You can't see the details, but it goes on and on. These are basic drugs that there are shortages of because of this business decisions to cease production as manufacturing in the U.S. and elsewhere plummets. It goes on and on, business decision, business decision to close because they can't compete with the subsidized prices. Again, these companies are not competing with Chinese companies. They're competing with the government. What about India? One of the surprise, very surprising things I found while writing China Rx is that it turns out India is dramatically dependent on China for about 70% of those raw materials, the things at the tip of the triangle. And during uh, COVID, uh, this came, uh, came out publicly. What was also shocking is how India's military is also dependent on China for basic medicines for penicillin and its derivatives, for di diabetes drugs. It was really quite, quite, rem and acetaminophen, India dependent on China, for something as basic as acetaminophen in a country where we think is a big generic powerhouse. The risks are very clear. This was a hearing on Capitol Hill where uh, illustrating the dependence of the military on China for basic medicines. Medicine, if you, medicines you can, not have much, you know, you can contaminate it. We've had contaminated products uh, coming into the United States and elsewhere that have caused deaths in the United States, the heparin, the blood thinner. Hundreds of Americans died and untold numbers were injured. So medicines can be used as a weapon of war, just as food was used as a weapon of war in World War I and World War II in Europe. And once again, the regulatory agencies cannot assure safe medicines. And the EMA, I congratulate them for their transparency. They've said publicly that they've had, they make trade-offs between having shortages and importing medicines that are substandard. It's really quite shocking how quickly in about 15, 20 years, uh, things have gone downhill. What do we do about it? What we're seeing uh, here in the US, and I'd love to hear uh, what is happening uh, from your perspective in the EU, we are seeing uh, some 
growing interest in US-based manufacturing simply for the most basic generic drugs. And even better, we're seeing private purchasers, private hospitals that are setting up a nonprofit to create a new supply chain that's reliable and safe. This is a nonprofit group formed by 1,200 hospitals. And they've already, uh, through contract manufacturing, they've already um, produced 60 different products for their hospitals. We're talking about basic antibiotics that hospitals couldn't get. And none of these facilities had shortages during COVID. And so this is expanding rapidly. They're opening up a new manufacturing facility. They broke ground on it in um, earlier this year. They'll be making sterile injectables, which are extraordinarily problematic. And they're transparent on where their product is made, which is highly unusual. And the reason it took me a private citizen to delve into this is because the industry has been totally non-transparent on where their product is coming from because they know the public has trust issues with products uh, coming in from China. And this was presented on Capitol Hill. This is totally transparent about these are the drugs are where the finished product is made and where the active ingredient is made. And I think we're gonna be seeing more of this because of the trust issue and the competitive advantage it affords. And also and from cost perspective, it can dramatically reduce the cost of manufacturing using new technology called continuous manufacturing. Oh, and so in summary, we have a serious uh, security uh, issue as well as national security concerns. When we have a centralization of the global supply of products, these are essential for life. And they're all centralized in a single country. We wouldn't do this with energy supplies for natural gas, for oil, for, we, we just wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do it for food to have 90% of food commodity sources from a single country. So there needs to be some diversification for risk mitigation. And I'm delighted to say that appears to be happening. And I wanna close with uh, a short video clip. This, was, uh, this is the reality of what's happening. I mentioned the blood pressure medicines that were contaminated with a carcinogen. Turns out this is a carcinogen used to make rocket fuel. And this is a, a drug that has been used by millions of people in Europe and the US until it was recalled in July of 2018. And this is a spontaneous um, statement from a gentleman, retired military, who spoke up during a hearing about his own experience with his blood pressure medicines containing rocket fuel that was coming from China. So I'm gonna queue up the video, it's just a Quick 90 second clip. The line of uh, uh, questions and responses uh, just uh, struck me. And uh, I have to say, I'm a military retiree. As a consequence, if I take regular prescriptions, I'm required to use express scripts. Yes, they do a great job. Uh, in the past three months, I have had four. Met, blood pressure medications recalled. Uh, when I tracked down the sourcing, they all came out of India, but originally sourced in China. Uh, from four different U.S. Manu supposed manufacturers, at least providers, companies. Uh, in each case, uh, that particular medication was contaminated with rocket fuel. If you did a little work on the internet, you could figure that out. So <laughs> I know it's not your fault, but I think it's really important that something be done about this by the Department of Defense uh, and the U.S. government in general. The other medication uh, wasn't contaminated with rocket fuel, but again, three recalls in a three-month period. I mean, I imagine active duty people have the same problem. And that affects the readiness of our force. 
Well, thank you, Rosemary, for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, talk, actually about the scarcity of resources and how you can actually strategically uh, provide access or deny access to important resources. The questions have been flowing in. We still have a little over five minutes, so I hope we can uh, uh, pose some more questions from the audience. The first question is from Casper, uh, who is wondering, what are the alternatives to today's global supply chains to ensure medicine safety when it comes to quantity and quality? So do you see a role uh, for the FDA and both the EDA? Because sometimes they are in, comp in competition as well when it comes to market access. I think the solution is for, um, first of all, who's buying substandard generic drugs and selling them to the uh, people of Europe and to people of America? Who's buying these products? If there were substandard tires that were having blowouts on highways and people were injured or killed, that wouldn't be tolerated. So we have to go back to who's purchasing these substandard products and putting them in, the, in your country's hospitals and healthcare systems. They need to buy differently. They need to buy a trustworthy product that's not in shortage. And so the solution is let's use our procurement and our purchasing power differently to buy a trustworthy quality product where the FDA and the, and the EMA, European Medicines Agency, can actually go inspect. You know, for the past year, there's been no, no inspections because of COVID. And so we're, all of us, we're all taking unregulated products because the inspections of manufacturing facilities are the heart of it. So we have to use our procurement dollars from government and the private sector to buy differently, to buy a trustworthy product. And we have to invest in advanced manufacturing and over time the cost differential will be minimal. Thank you for the question, I appreciate it. Thank you, and we have already a next question that's from Leo. And Leo is wondering, well, can NATO actually play a role in overcoming this problem? Like, is it really a security problem or not? Uh, given you can, of course, withheld uh, people from, from certain resources to gain uh, uh, more uh, the upper hand in, let's say, a conflict? Or is this merely a challenge for states and institutions such as the EU, the EDA and the FDA? Do, do you really see a security component here? Well, I would uh, leave that for all of you to decide. Uh, I, if someone controls the supply of medicine, if someone controls the supply of food, and I'm talking about the medicines we need for survival. That gives you enormous advantage. You look back to when rare earths, which are not that much a matter of life and death as antibiotics are. Remember when uh, there was the a Japanese fishing vessel incident and uh, China used its leverage uh, to uh, stop exporting rare earths to Japan, which would have crippled its industries. And the New York Times reported that U.S. companies were also affected by some trade issue that China didn't like the U.S. stance on. So I think it's up to you to decide whether it's a national security issue. But um, from my vantage point, my vantage point of the average person on the street that I talk to, uh, they see now. And look what's happening within uh, the South China Sea. You know, if your supply chain is cut off, you lose control over price and you lose control over if and when you'll get anything. Look what's in the U.S., there's huge supply chain issues just for refrigerators and dishwashers. Well, thank you. You have to um, wait months for it. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a huge and a quick thing. There was a senior federal government official who had to wait three months for a blood pressure medicine after the recalls. So it's a health security and national security issue, I believe. That's really interesting. I'm not sure if you heard our previous uh, speaker talking uh, about China and also our threat perception uh, from a Western perspective. So uh, with an eye to that, uh, Pella was wondering, well, given that this seems a very purposeful and aggressive move, and I was actually wondering myself, in your research, did you find anything um, that sort of proves the expectation of Chris Oldendorf? Are there any signs that we are deprived of certain access to medication or is it something or is it just a problem that we see happening right now due to the pandemic? I, I would encourage you uh, all of you to read a book called Unrestricted Warfare. It was written a number of years ago by 
I believe they're uh, Chinese uh, military leaders. Take a look at that. We will. Thank you so and much. The other, oh. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'll say is there was a, a hearing where a gentleman had been asked by 20 different advanced industries to understand some anomalies they were seeing in their sectors. And what they found was systemic, systemic legal and illegal means of disrupting those industries with the intent, clearly, of domination. So there's also an economic warfare going on. And I asked him, did you see the same thing with pharmaceuticals? He said, yes. So I would, again, I came at this with no preconceived notions, but as a lay person, there's a very serious problem if a single country, whatever country it is, controls your food supply, your medicine supply, or your energy supply to heat homes in winter. It's a problem, I think. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insight and ideas. We do have some questions left over, but unfortunately we've been running out of time. Uh, it's time for our next speaker, Colonel Niels Woutstra, the Deputy Head uh, Permanent Military Representatives to the EU and NATO. I keep struggling with the very, very long titles in international relations. And Niels Woutstra will be hel holding a talk on the growing control of China over the South China Sea and the implications for NATO partners in the region. Thank you very much, uh, Dibutje, for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, the subject of my talk uh, will be uh, Chinese hybrid warfare, and I will indeed allude not only to the two uh, Chinese colonels who, who wrote this, uh, this famous book uh, on uh, unrestricted warfare, but I will also say a few things about, uh, about the South China Sea. So my talk will be along four questions. Um, the first one being, why is the rise of China a challenge for the West in general and NATO in particular? Secondly, what does the Chinese, Chinese hybrid warfare strategy consist of? Third, how does that strategy work? And fourth, what are the consequences for NATO? <clears throat> well, it, it's for the first question, why is the rise of China a challenge for the West? We already heard the previous speakers. Uh, how we made ourselves dependent on China, for instance. But it's very clear that the one-party autocratic system does not concur with our Western democratic values, human rights, economic rules, Geneva Conventions, and the rules-based international order in general. But they're not going to stay there. There are 1.4 billion people, and they're amongst us, and they influence also our way of life. China strives to be a dominant power, the dominant power in 2049. And this is, of course, a symbolic year because then the Communist Party will be 100 years in power in the Chinese People's Republic. But there is maybe an acceleration. We will not have to wait until 2049 because, e.g., the pandemic, the COVID uh, pandemic showed that uh, China was able to sustain e an economic growth last year of 2 to 3 percent, whereas the West saw their economies shrink. So the question is, is China going to be, a, or is it a competitor, is it a rival, or will it eventually be our enemy? The good news is that there is no direct military threat yet to NATO, but we may say that hybrid warfare is already going on. So the second question, what does the Chinese hybrid warfare strategy consist of? We really need a paradigm shift. Our Western lens through which we look at international relations is not enough, is not sufficient. Our Western theories, like neorealism, do not suffice. It was President Xi himself who said that the Chinese society state is profoundly Confucian. Confu Confucius and Sun Tzu were strategists and philosophers 
of 500 years before Christ. Sun Tzu's work is now well known in the Western world. It's called The Art of War. And I think it's really a must read. It's a concise book, 13 short chapters with short aphorisms, short statements. You may read it in two hours time. It's essential to understand Chinese thinking. For instance, he says, to win 100 victories in 100 battles is not the acme of skill. The acme of skill is to subdue the enemy without fighting. And this is at the heart of the Chinese strategy, which was not known at the time of von Clausewitz or Jomini or Mahan. So we may call this hybrid warfare. And hybrid warfare is not, hybrid warfare is not only warfare with civilian means. It's a, like your hybrid car, it's a blend, it's a mixture of military and civilian means. And as the previous speaker already alluded to, hybrid warfare in China is being called unrestricted warfare. And these were indeed two Chinese colonels who wrote this book. And you can find it on the internet. It's a free ebook. The two colonels, Liang and Xiang Xi. And in their book, Unrestricted Warfare, everything can become a weapon. For instance, uh, manipulations of exchange rates, influencing, maneuvering in the information domain. But be aware. There is a myth, the myth of the peaceful rise of China. Remember that China is very much able to use force. Think of the Korean War, 5053, how, the, how they took the Paracels by force from Vietnam in 1974. And think of the violence on the Tiananmen Square in 1989. And of course, the Chinese as we heard already, one part of their strategy, their hybrid strategy, is to deprive us, if necessary, from their point of view, us from essential goods. And with all this goes strategic patience, where we in the West are submitted to ever-changing democratic leaders. Of course, it's a matter of continuity in China. One party, one leader. And we will see him for another few years, I think. So the third question, how does this strategy eventually work out? Well, there are several ways how hybrid warfare works out. There is theft of intellectual property for business purposes by hacks. But also legally, the Chinese students in other Western universities, at least half of them, is linked to the People's Liberation Army. We should, we should not be naive about this. Another part of the strategy is the debt trap. Giving loans to poor countries who in their turn are not able to pay their debts and then eventually they have to hand in their infrastructure and other means. Divide and rule strategy. China does not want to deal with EU, NATO, ASEAN, but will always try to tore alliances apart and deal one-to-one -one with individual countries. And then, of course, they are the strong party. The People's Liberation Army is uh, really innovating, and especially the People's Liberation Army Navy. It used to be a coastal navy, but now it's going to be a world-class navy. The People's Liberation Army Navy is already bigger than the US Navy, so it's the biggest navy today. Uh, maybe not as strong, but in numbers, they have overtaken them. Um, ten years ago, they did sea trials with the first aircraft carrier, 
and there are several aircraft carriers now under construction. Now the South China Sea, and this is a matter of hybrid warfare, of lawfare. Under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, this is, and these are international waters, like, for instance, the Mediterranean or the Black Sea. These seas belong to everyone and to nobody at the same time. The Chinese see this differently. There is a map from 1947 what they, with the nine dash line, and it basically means that the Chinese think is their conviction that the South China Sea is a matter of Chinese sovereignty and they treat it as an inner sea of China. Despite the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea and despite a 2016 ruling of the International Court. And this means that with this strategic patience, now the Paracel Islands, the Spratly Islands, uh, Scarborough Show, everywhere now you can find runways, military installations, and this is also a matter of hybrid warfare because what happens is that fishing militia, they sail out with concrete and steel to those reefs and islands, runways are being built, and then they go fishing and come back with fish, and they start all over again. And these fishing militia of hundreds of ships, paramilitary, they do not hesitate also to hamper and harass their colleagues from other countries. You don't need to be a prophet to see and to know that Taiwan is under severe strain and threat today. I'm afraid it will be like Hong Kong, it's a matter of years and uh, Taiwan will be uh, maybe invaded or will have to go so much pressure that uh, uh, it has to, uh, to follow the rules from Beijing. There is this Belt and Road Initiative from the South China Sea, the big ports, all the way to Europe, overland and oversea. And to that way, China has bought, with money, many harbors, like Gwadar in Pakistan, Djibouti, Piraeus, close to Athens, but also a big part of Rotterdam is now in Chinese hands and has been for a while. You see expansion also in the Arctic. There is an Arctic strategy from China a few years ago, and they call themselves a near Arctic state, and they let their influence there grow as well. So, final question, what are the consequences for NATO? Well, actually, the last NATO strategic concept dates from 2010. It's called Active Engagement Modern Defense. You can find it on the internet, it's N-Class. And in this uh, strategic concept, which is outdated, which is recognized by NATO, for instance, Russia is still called a partner. It does not allude in any way to China. Not even the summit declaration of 2018 of the NATO summit does not mention China at all. It's only over the last couple, two and a half years, that within NATO one starts talking about China and it's a hot topic nowadays. It's very clear that NATO interests are not limited only to the well-known North Atlantic Treaty area. Today, you need to deal with a 360 degrees threat. It's all around. It's cyber. It's space. It, do it does not stop at a physical boundary. So we need to change our minds. Contact war will become more and more no contact war at remote attacks in cyberspace, but also physical. So there is a big awareness without, within NATO nowadays that we cannot stop thinking at the boundaries of 
the NATO treaty area. Because what used to be regional, what used to be territory, is going to be more and more global, all encompassing. So there will be a summit this year, we think in June, with, of course, a new US administration at the table, new US president, and very likely there will be the start of a new strategic concept. And within the NATO headquarters, one is already thinking ahead about this new strategic concept. And for sure, it will elude to China. And this is very essential because NATO is the only transatlantic alliance which can counterbalance China. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Niels Woutzer, with military precision, 15 minutes on the spot. I would like to invite you to join me here. And uh, for all those viewers at home, the questions are already pouring in. And since we have 15 minutes fully at our disposal, we'll try to answer them all. Niels, thank you, thank you so much. I was wondering, because I know you as someone who has always been very vocal on the need for clear strategic thinking, formulate your goals, navigate your way towards that goals, countering or deflecting threats whenever necessary. However, what if everything is a possible threat? You can weaponize everything. You can weaponize, well, medicine we saw, food supplies, ports. So where to begin? Well, it's, um, this makes our profession uh, <laughs> very interesting because it's no longer about uh, uh, attrition and steel on steel, so to say, but we have to be able to conceptually think of all instruments of power. And of, co of course, the ultimate instrument of power is still the military instrument of power. Th that's the stick. But you also need a carrot and everything which is in between. So this makes our profession very, very inter uh, interesting, together with those who are, of course, uh, involved with uh, foreign affairs and international relations, etc. It forces some creative uh, thinking in the field. Absolutely. Yes. Well, let's get to the questions uh, from the audience at home. Uh, Andreas is wondering, are European policymakers sufficiently addressing the issue of external reliance? Uh, and is the ambition of the European strategic autonomy probable or even viable in this context? Yeah, I think this is a question maybe which uh, refers a little bit to the previous speaker as well. Yeah, yeah, it sort of overlaps a bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, w what we can see in China, for instance, is that they very cleverly um, mix the military and civilian industry for dual use. Uh, so they are very rapidly able to change from uh, civilian use to military use. And indeed, um, in the West, we should think more about these things. It, uh, it should be a wake-up call for us as well to have more resilience in our societies, but also more resi resilience in our, in our armed forces. Uh, today, I do not think that in, uh, as far as our military materiel is concerned, we are too much reliant on uh, either China or, uh, or Russia, fortunately. So we have the, the military material, material is still uh, in our own hands. Even though we have to be very careful about rare earths, for instance. Yeah. Uh, rare earths coming either from Africa or China itself. Uh, that it can, of course, there are elements which could be limiting factors in our uh, defense procurement. Yeah, clearly. And uh, another question from uh, Shaila. Um, what do you think, you already alluded a bit to it in your speech, but what do you think of the re recent change uh, with the presidency of uh, Joe Biden uh, in the United States? And not only with regards to the NATO stance, but also the EU stance towards the South China Sea conflict. So re really specific on that conflict. And is it likely we will see more cooperation between Europe and the US in this region in the upcoming years, whether it's through NATO or EU? I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, I think um, the Biden administration, President Biden, he is not soft with China or Russia or any autocratic uh, system. But uh, I think together 
with uh, the Allies. Uh, there is uh, a strong diplomatic effort to, uh, to, uh, to shape the future. So uh, we are very happy with that and we are very happy that, uh, of course, uh, with the uh, summit in, uh, in June, that we will, uh, with the new uh, NATO strategic concept, uh, there is, there is uh, a promising future ahead of us. Yeah, because Joe Biden, of course, I think this was during the run of his presidency, he wrote an article in Foreign Affairs in which he said that America lost a lot of prestige, uh, also when it comes to alliances. Uh, would you say that uh, countering the, the, the Chinese potential threat towards NATO will be part of restoring the American prestige within the alliance? Uh, I think uh, the United States is still the world leader. Um, they very vigorously take on this, uh, this uh, task again this mission um, and uh, both with uh, well with these big autocratic systems uh, Russia and and China we see a dual track of uh, on one hand keeping the dialogue open we have strong economic ties especially with China uh, but on the other hand also uh, be ready to withstand uh, human rights violations uh, and other uh, breaches of international law and the rules-based uh, international order in general. And another question uh, from Kasper. Um, he was wondering which strategies does NATO have to maintain an edge in military technologies? So how does NATO ensure it's, uh, yeah, it's on the cutting edge of technology? Well, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the nice thing is that we have a special strategic command in Norfolk, Virginia, which is Allied Command Transformation, and they're constantly um, uh, paving the way and uh, reflecting on uh, future uh, innovations so that we can maintain this edge uh, of, of innovation and technology. Uh, but uh, it's a matter also of investment and readiness to invest uh, from the NATO members. Are we doing that enough? Uh, we Investing? Are, <laughs> uh, we? We, we NATO members or maybe? Well, the United States uh, does an excellent job. They spent something like 3.5% of the GDP uh, on, uh, on defense. Uh, so the United States by itself uh, is uh, by far the biggest contributor, uh, not only worldwide, but also more specifically in Europe. So we should be very grateful uh, to them for that. Uh, there are other countries among the Netherlands which are f uh, far uh, underperforming. Um, we committed ourselves in 2014 to 2% of our GDP and we are now at something like 1.4, 1.5%. So, so there's a long, long way, way to go. go. <laughs> uh, another question very interesting from Brian. He was wondering how do Chinese security experts and policymakers actually perceive the somewhat struggling way in which we try to cope with their rise? Aren't they laughing at us? So when it comes to threat perception, yeah, um, I must be very honest that uh, I'm, I'm not a specialist on what the Chinese think about us. Um, but it's very clear that uh, they have a strong uh, policy, they know what they want, and they have this strategic patience to, uh, to achieve their aims. And it's not, it's not things which are going to happen overnight, you see it gradually, and the, every, every time a small step which does not trigger a reaction in general, very often, but you know, it's like this famous frog which you cook uh, very slowly uh, when you put it in the water. It's not the, the, the frog being put in, in boiling water at once. They boil the frog very slowly. And this is very dangerous, of course, because we are very often not aware uh, or not able to react to those small steps. Yeah, I was wondering, is it a question of uh, lacking strategic patience or do we not have a clear strategy? Because it also came forward in the other panels on, uh, for instance, the Arctic, uh, on the continental Africa, and here again on China, where you see actually the same thing happening, the, the same critique, namely, we are very ad hoc, uh, reactive, we're responding to situations that have been emerging over time, uh, but only once it's in our face, we start thinking about what to do with it. Is it also something you... Well, it depends a bit, little bit on who is we. Let's uh, say NATO. NATO, yeah, na well, 
uh, I think the the, uh, the 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 leader uh, leader of the world and leader of NATO, uh, the United States, they have a clear they have a clear strategy. Yeah. Um, and they have many think tanks, and they have, of course, uh, uh, huge uh, state departments and uh, many uh, very clever people thinking about the future and about strategy. Um, so they very often take the lead, and the rest of NATO, uh, I would, would not say will follow, but very often it takes on the, the good suggestions which already yeah. uh, come from the US. And there's another question from Nick, um, and he is referring actually to the debt trap that you uh, mentioned yep. uh, in your speech. He was wondering, are there any limits to this debt trap? Can governments nationalize their infrastructure that has been claimed by China? For instance, can we buy back the port of Rotterdam? Well, you, you probably, it, it differs from country to country. You probably need uh, legislation for that, but um, I think the, we had a wake-up call now in the Netherlands. Uh, I know the specific case of the Netherlands. We do not uh, sort of sell out, uh, you know, uh, uh, without limit our infrastructure. So there are now limits being put on what we are going to sell and what not. So that's good. But um, China also deals with rogue states, failed states, poor states, you know, corrupt states. Exactly. And then they deal with the government and, of course, then it's sometimes rather easy to have a contract yeah. which is in favor of China not, and maybe in favor of those who are in power in that country, but not... At the moment, yeah. At that yeah. very moment, but not necessarily uh, in, in favor of the country uh, in the short and long term. Um, another question from Ariana. Uh, you mentioned that China operates by tearing alliances apart, so the divide and conquer uh, bit. But how has an alliance formation played a part in Chinese hybrid warfare, such as economic alliances? So if I understand this uh, question correctly, of course, forming an alliance, uh, whether it is, you know, uh, because from the outside the EU can be perceived as a sort of protectionist blob uh, where you have to uh, uh, compete against. So th this also, of course, triggers China in a sense to compete with that. Yeah, well, I think uh, we, uh, for instance, the EU is our, we, th this is our economic alliance in the first place yeah. uh, from the origins. Uh, we really need to keep our ranks closed uh, and not to let us be played apart by China. They, they're trying. They, the Chinese are trying. There's uh, 17 plus one. You may have heard about it. They're trying also within uh, within uh, Europe to to sort of sever countries from from the EU and deal with them individually uh, and try to lure them into this debt trap. So uh, what is very important as a matter of strategy is that we keep our ranks closed in our alliances. That's essential. Yeah, is it they have some sort of benefit, you know, it's a very centralized government, of course, and they have this one government and they have a clear strategy, while we, for our strategic purposes, we depend on several international organizations, uh, several bilateral agreements. So with us, it's much more fragmentized uh, strategic cooperation. Would you say that's an extra challenge with perspective to China? Well, yes and no. Um, NATO, if, if, we, if we concentrate on NATO, NATO has 30 members of very different size, of course. Um, and in NATO, everything is being decided by consensus. So we have seen that over the last more than 70 years, NATO has been very adaptive. At the end of the day, all the, all the changes from crisis management to collective defense and back, uh, all those adaptations have been, uh, have been gone through uh, successfully. And once a decision is being made within NATO, it's very, very powerful because 30 countries then agreed on something. So take, for instance, a summit declaration. Sometimes there are 100 work strands. If you, if you analyze it, it means that on those 100 work strands, we, we all agree how, what, what should be the way ahead. And this makes NATO a very strong alliance, uh, politically and militarily. And this is why it's also so much being attacked, because one of the paradigms of one of the uh, sayings of Sun Tzu is that you have to attack the alliances of your enemy. That is one of his, uh, uh, I gave it as a suggestion to, to read, but one of his uh, primary strategies is to attack the alliances 
of your opponents. Yeah, so it takes a time to agree upon something, but once you have agreed on something, of course, you have the power it's very of the combination of your collectiveness. Um, there's another question from Pella. He was wondering, do you think an increased focus on containing China will make NATO less likely or able to push back against Russia? It's a very interesting question. I think um, we saw, I, I alluded to the um, uh, still uh, active uh, uh, strategic concept where Russia was still a partner, you know, with uh, Glasnost and Perestroika and uh, uh, and Gorbachev and Yeltsin, those were wonderful times because there was almost friendship between Russia and, and NATO. Uh, unfortunately, this has completely toppled. Um, uh, we are very sad about that. Uh, maybe one day uh, Russia will shift a little bit back into our camp. Uh, they will eventually see that abiding to the rules-based international order, uh, good economic ties, etc., fighting corruption, uh, etc. is final, finally the best way. But we know that uh, uh, Mr. Putin might be in power to, until uh, he's 80-something, <laughs> 83, I think. Uh, so um, we have to see what will happen. Um, so, uh, but there's a big difference between Russia and China. Russia has a, a corrupt economy with, uh, which is very monolithic, very dependent on uh, uh, oil and gas. Um, uh, we know about oligarchs, uh, etc. Uh, the the population is shrinking. The country is very poor. Um, many al much alcoholism. So it's a, it's it's demographically a very difficult country. Yeah. And uh, so. Um, uh, uh, what we saw with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that they eventually gave up uh, spending 30% of the GDP on, uh, on, on military uh, uh, stuff. Uh, um, so if they're wise, the Russians, I would say they should follow the, the, the strategy. If you can't beat them, join them. Join them. <laughs> so they should join us. Uh, and then the big challenge with 1.4 billion people is this autocratic system a little bit more to the east, which is China. Okay, thank you very much. Almost with military precision, we're one minute over time. And we, at least there's still four or five more questions. So, but we tried, we did our best. We had a, a, a lot of questions that were answered. So thank you very much, Niels Wautsta, for your contribution. Uh, we had, of course, a cartoonist following us today and he made a general uh, cartoon, which will be shown during the break. We'll have a short 15 minute break and then we will get back to you for our final speech with Jaap de Hoop Scheffer.